Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is the Short Sports Show. I'm your host, Daniel Short. Got a good episode. We're going to recap the NFL, what happened last night on opening night. Then we're going to talk about a few games coming up this weekend in both college football and in the pro football. But before we get into all that, make sure you follow me on Twitter, at short underscore sports 24-7. Also follow me on Facebook, the Short Sports Show. And if you miss any episodes, don't worry, I got you covered. Go on YouTube, type in The Short Sports Show. You'll find a few episodes that you might have missed. Make sure you like and subscribe. It really helps me out and makes the channel grow. So, like I said, we're going to recap on the NFL what happened last night. Last night, it was the Baltimore Ravens at the Denver Broncos. And, well, I kind of knew it was going to be the Denver was going to dominate that game just because of the key losses that Baltimore had over the offseason, and I'm not just talking about Ray Lewis and Ed Reed. There's a lot more that went into that with um, a few players that, of course, right now can't come off off the top of my head, but um, it was obvious that Baltimore needs a lot of help on defense. Now, not taking anything away from the Denver Broncos, I mean, Payne Manning was on fire, and everybody knows that Denver's Denver's offense was going to be, you know, top notch this year like it was last year. You know, Payne Manning, here are a few stats. Seven touchdowns, seven touchdowns, 462 yards. Demarius Thomas was the leading receiver with 161 yards and two touchdowns where he just broke a few ankles on one of the catches. It was about a good, what could have been just about a four-yard gain turned into a 20-yard gain for the Denver Broncos, which later led on to a touchdown. But um, the Broncos offense led the charts throughout the entire game just you know the first half first quarter I should say was a little you know tweaks that they needed to fix and they obviously did coming out firing especially in the second half and while Baltimore Ravens had no offense whatsoever I mean the first quarter uh they did pretty solid but after that they just they couldn't do anything um to me the Baltimore Ravens offense is boring uh, I've watched a few of their games just like last night. Their offense is just, they're not a team I want to watch on uh, offensively. You know, Ray Rice is a great running back. Joe Flacco is overpaid for, he's basically like the Trent Dilfer for them. I mean, you look back on the first Super Bowl, Baltimore won, uh, and they had Trent Dilfer, and they were led by their defense. Exactly the same thing that was last year. Except, you know, they had better offensive uh, targets with Ray Rice and uh, Anquan Bolden, Torrey Smith, what's you know, going on. But they were led by the, the heart and soul from their defense. And obviously that's all gone. And I, I just think they're going to struggle this year. That's why I ha- have the Bengals uh, winning that division. But also, I mean, you could just see how Denver just was dominating the entire game just – they had it under control, and this game, I know it's just week one, and I know we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves, but this game tells me, and should tell everybody else, that they are the AFC favorites, if not the Super Bowl favorites for this year. Now, again, I understand it's week one, but this just shows how explosive they are. I mean, Payne Manning, seven touchdowns. Seven touchdowns. That, that is incredible. I knew he was going to throw for four and possibly five. I didn't think it would get up to this many. Um, but that was just unbelievable. And it just shows why Ball, excuse me, Denver is the dominant team in the AFC and in the NFL. But uh, other than that, there wasn't anything else that caught my eye um, other than how Ryan Seacrest literally ruined the first half of the game for me. Uh, it, I don't know why they used him to, you know, I know I understand they're promoting their shows, but I, I agree with the Baltimore, or excuse me, the Denver fans that were just booing him. He, that's, that's, NFL is a man show and you're going to put Ryan Seacrest on to open up. That's, that's not a way you open up football. Um, but like I said, we're going to go ahead and go into the NFL games, what to watch. Um, these are five games for me that I want to see, um, because of specific reasons on how um, teams are going to perform. We know we got new coaches, we got new players, new staff, how they're going to be able to perform. 
I got first game on my list is the New York Giants versus the Dallas Cowboys. The reason is new play calling for the Dallas Cowboys. How are they going to be able to perform against a much upgraded defense from the New York for the New York Giants? Monty Kiffin calling the plays for defensively for the Dallas Cowboys. How the Tampa Two defense and moving from a three four to a four three. How it's going to affect the Dallas Cowboys and moving uh, the Marcus Ware to the defensive end. How will that um, impact that defense? Will it make it better? Will it make it um, less intimidating? I, I think they'll be able to get enough pressure on Eli Manning to make it make a few mis- for Eli Manning to make a few mistakes. Um, but again, it's just it's, I, I can't really predict too much on it because I really haven't seen Monty Kiffin's uh, defense um, other than just highlights from back in 2002. But obviously, that's a much different game than it is now. Um, also, with Jason Garrett giving up the play calling duties on offense, um, how will they be able to run their offense? Um, I, I like to see a lot more play action in the game. Uh, using DeMarco Murray, and I believe they'll be able to run the ball more fish, efficiently uh, than they were last year. The second game, <clears throat> excuse me, second game I got Philadelphia versus the Washington Redskins, which open up uh, Monday night. Also, the Giants and Cowboys game open up Sunday night. Uh, with the Eagles, how is Chip Kelly going to be able to bring the speed option? into the NFL and will it succeed like you heard me uh, on the last episode I I don't see it succeeding in the NFL Uh, you know I understand that there's a few teams like the Redskins and some of the other teams that have mobile quarterbacks be able to run it but again that's just a few plays every now and then that is not something they run 90% of the time Chip Kelly that, that was his entire offense in college at Oregon now you're having to move it up here. He's going to have some more of the pro-style offense, you know, the eye formation, stuff like that. But how is he going to re- be able to rely on that speed option when it doesn't work? And then, I don't know. I just It's going to be interesting to see, especially having a tough test against the Washington defense, which is pretty solid. Um, but how, I, I just don't see it succeeding uh, in the NFL. RG3's, um, RG3's health, how is that going to be able – is he at 100% like he says? And they kept him out there in the preseason, which I agree with. Um, that's what the San Diego Chargers did uh, with LT. Though he was not injured, they just kept him out because they wanted to make sure he did not get injured. And I agree with this, especially with him having an injury. Um, I think it was more in his benefit for him to not – start uh and start start in the preseason but um it should be uh interesting how he goes up against uh philadelphia's defense my honest opinion he's not going to put up the exact same numbers as peyton manning i don't think anybody will throughout the rest of the year for that single individual game but i do think he's going to light up the scoreboard my prediction I think he runs for over 80 to 90 yards, also throws for over 300 yards. And touchdown-wise, you know, good three touchdowns passing and maybe a rushing touchdown into that. But um, I, I don't feel positive on Philadelphia's defense. I know they got some good people coming in, as we talked about in the la- last episode on the NFC East division. But I think RG3 will be healthy. Um should be 100% in, in my mind because uh, I'm not saying he's going to do what Adrian Peterson did coming off the same injury, but I do think with the time he had off, he should come back to uh, back to normal pace. Um, might be a little bit slower, but I think he's not going to be enough where someone's going to just really notice it unless they're just watching him every single play. But I, I think he, he'll be um, back to normal, basically. Third game, I got the Green Bay Packers versus the San Francisco 49ers. And, and the reason I put that game is, is it's because Colin Kaepernick, this last year was his second year in the league, but it is 
was his, basically like his rookie year, you know, starting um, first time starting last year. Will he have somewhat of a, I guess you could say, sophomore slump? Um, will he be able to continue to, you know, run the way he did last season? I mean, again, remember last season that was the first time people had saw Colin Kaepernick in an NFL game and how he can perform. The only film they had on him was either from the previous weeks or from college. Uh, and there's a huge growth from that time. And so can he be able, now that he has a full season under him and people can see how he played, has he gotten better or is he the same? Or have people have finally found a way to stop him? And also that goes to RG3, the same thing. Now having a full season, will they be able to stop stop him from running as much as much as they did last season. Green Bay's offense losing uh, Greg Jennings to uh, Minnesota um, and having some younger guys stepping up. Will that can we see a, a difference in their offense? And Eddie Lacy, I saw him through preseason. He was an absolute beast the entire time, breaking through tackles like crazy. So I like to see him step up. And, you know, was it just, you know, preseason playing against, you know, those second, third string guys? Is he the same? And if so, being able to power up against guys, especially on the 49ers defense, you know, that that's probably the second best defense. I think 49, or excuse me, the Seahawks have the best defense in the league. But going against that defense, especially for Aaron Rodgers going against, remember, they would, he was there last year in the playoffs. And lost pretty bad, too. So is he going to be able to be effective? Or is it a tough defense where he's just not going to be able to get the job done? Fourth game, I got the Seattle Seahawks versus the Or will they have a sophomore slump? Can Cam Newton step up? Now, first overall pick from Auburn. Won a national championship, which, you know, that's debatable on if they should have played Oregon. I believe they should have played TCU. Just go look it up and you'll see why. Anyways, uh, <laughs> call, excuse me, Cam Newton has not performed the way a number one pick should be. I'm not a fan of him. Uh, well, I am a fan of him, but NFL, when people say who's better, Andy Dalton or Cam Newton, and, you know, again, Andy Dalton from TCU, but his, sec his two years that he's been in the NFL, he's taken the team to the playoffs. Back-to-back, -back, yes, yes, they lost uh, both times to Houston, but has gotten better each year. You look at Andy Dalton's stats, they've gotten better and better. Cam Newton, you know, threw for 4,600 yards or 4,700 yards his rookie year. But ultimately, even though I'm a stats person, the main stat that counts is wins and losses. Cam Newton has an under 500 record in his two years that he's been with the Carolina Panthers, while Andy Dalton has an above 500 record and has gotten better every year. Though he does not throw more yards than Cam Newton does, he does get the win and that's ultimately that's all that matters. You know, if there's a quarterback who throws 15 passes, completes nine, gets 100 yards, maybe a touchdown, maybe even throws a pick, but wins the game and manages the game correctly, that's who you want your starting quarterback to be. I mean, if you can pick up a Peyton Manning who throws seven touchdowns and 462 yards, that's even better. But you, you understand what I'm saying. And Cam Newton is not a winning quarterback. And especially since he was so used to winning at Blinn Junior College and at Auburn, then comes to Carolina, couldn't handle it his rookie year with losing. Same thing for the second year. You know, Now he's got better targets, and, and there is always that argument with, oh, Andy Dalton had better offense, he had better defense. Not really. Not really. I mean, yeah, he had – not even – Carolina had a better running game, and yet still – couldn't win with, you know, doing a play action or stuff like that. Couldn't 
couldn't do anything. Andy Dalton had to build off and grow his receivers. You look at his receiver, obviously it's A.J. Green, Jermaine Gresham. Now they got more targets, but the past two years, that was basically it. Two targets. Cam Newton had an entire backfield full of great running backs. Had, obviously, Steve Smith, Greg Olson at tight end. And, I'll, yeah, you could say that was basically it, too. But, you know, they had a... They could have relied more on the running game, which would have helped the passing game improve a lot better. And I'm probably missing out on a, a, tar- a wide receiver target from Carolina. But if you understand my point of just saying, if you throw, you know, for a certain passing yards, yes, that's great. But if you can't get the win, it doesn't matter. So th- that's all I have to say about Cam Newton. But will he be able to step up? Because if not... I don't know about you, but that's, that should be the hot seat right there. If two years you haven't performed, especially being a number one pick, I mean, what is what else is there to prove that you can't win? And you could say the tough division stuff, but it doesn't matter. As a number one pick, especially at a quarterback, it should be a lot better than what Cam Newton's being right now. My last game for the NFL side for this week is the Houston Texans at the San Diego Chargers. The reason I picked this game is Houston, are they going to be able to step up? You know, you know, past two years, they've, you know, put up great records and have dominated a few games, have came close to a few games. But when it came to the big teams, they can't win, especially in the playoffs. They get dominated by the New England Patriots. And now, in last year, I, I think they won against uh, the Denver Broncos at Denver. But... Denver, that was in, what, week three, week two, when they were just figuring out how they were going to run their offense. You know, because remember, the previous season, it was led by Tim Tebow. Then it was Peyton Manning. Huge difference. So, uh, can Houston, and I'm not saying San Diego's a great team, because I'm a fan of San Diego, but they're, they're not a great team. And uh, But will they be able to take steps and just, instead of just winning in the regular season, which obviously that's what you need to do, but can you win in the postseason? Have they improved on their offense and defensively losing? I think they lost their lead sack uh, player or second lead sack player in Connor Barwin to the Philadelphia Eagles. Will they be able to replace him and get the same productivity that they were that they got in him? On the San Diego side, how is their offense? Will it be better? They got Coach Mike McCoy from Denver. And what I saw in the preseason, I played, paid close attention to them. Uh, they got better offensive plays than they have in the past 10 years. But the offensive line is still lacking a whole lot of depth and, and, and talent, basically. So will they be able to compete with the front four of Houston's, which is led by J.J. Watt? It's going to be a tough test for them. I don't see San Diego getting the victory. I, I just hope they don't get blown out, especially on Monday night. We move over to the college side, um, which which was a great week last week. Um, but now this week, there's a few key games that I, I really like to watch. Uh, the first game is South Carolina, number six, South Carolina, against number 11, Georgia. Georgia lost to Clemson in a close game. Uh, Clemson was obviously the better team, led by Taj Boyd, who, again, number one quarterback. And South Carolina, you know, they did good the first half against North Carolina, but really was just bad. I mean, they should have blown this team out by 30, 40 points. They ended up winning the game 27-17, to 17, a 10-point victory over a team that is not up to par with with, with uh, South Carolina, what they should be at, but um, uh, the Javion Clowney was very, very ineffective in that game. Subbed out a lot, and people started talking about how was he in shape. He he missed a lot of plays, came out, and their reason for him coming out was they wanted to make sure he didn't get hurt in a meaningless game, which I understand that, but also what I heard on first take, it was a very good reason was that focusing on trying not to get hurt is what's going to eventually make you get hurt. Because that, that's what's going to be in the back of your mind the entire time. of trying, you know, 
I'm going to get hurt in the first week or first two weeks, and then I'm, my draft stock is going to drop, and I'm not going to be who they want me to be and this and that. That negativity in your mind is, is going to make him get hurt and ultimately is not going to be effective on the field because that's not what he's thinking about how making a play. He's thinking about trying not to get hurt, and that's not going to help him nor the team. So will he be able to step up, especially against a Georgia team that is upset because they lost to Clemson and they feel like they have more to prove than South Carolina does? Second game I got is Notre Dame versus Michigan. Uh, Notre Dame canceling the series, which is just stupid in my mind. I mean, Notre Dame-Michigan rivalry, I feel like that's a pretty solid rivalry. But they don't feel the same, and I think they're just tired of losing in my mind. Notre Dame had an okay win against uh, Temple. And Michigan did a dominating game against Central Michigan. And I talked about how I didn't believe in Devin Gardner uh, being a quarterback. Still don't. I mean, they played Central Michigan, so not a big team. And this is going to be his first test to print against a pretty solid defense. Uh, in Notre Dame, how will be how will he be able to uh, go against a, a much better defense? And you know, after this game, if he, he does pretty good, um, both stat wise and with the win, then you know I think he is a, a good quarterback. But if he uh, you know has a less than a fifty percent completion, then I, I or maybe less than forty five percent. I'll give him that then he's not going to be a quarterback that, you know, Michigan fans are going crazy for. Um, but other than that, that was basically it. But, you know, I can't, uh, it should be an interesting match, especially Michigan's wanna, gonna get that want to get that win spe- because of Notre Dame wanting to cancel the series and not thinking Michigan is up to par for a rivalry. Next game is Florida versus Miami. Now, like I said, Florida – Barely got a victory over Toledo at home. And and I said from the beginning, Florida is not a good team. Florida is not a top 10 team, not a top 15 team, not even a top 20 team. Now they have to go on the road to Miami, which is obviously not that far. I mean, really not. But Duke Johnson, remember that name, Duke Johnson, running back from Miami, going to be the number one running back in the nation this year. And I think he's just a sophomore, so he's not going to be eligible for the NFL draft. But either way, Duke Johnson, the, this is my stat for the game. So remember this. Mark this down. Write it down if you need to. And then you can come back and see that if I was right or not. Has over 195 yards rushing, more than two touchdowns, over 20 carries. That's my stat for him. And ultimately, I think Miami gets the victory. And... It's going to be a called an upset because Miami's not ranked and Florida is in the top number 12. But just remember that Duke Johnson leads Miami over over Florida. Florida drops down uh, to high 20s, even though they should completely drop out. But just remember that. Go ahead and write that down. If you need to replay this after this episode is uploaded, go for it. Duke Johnson. Third game, or excuse me, the fourth game is number two, Oregon, at Virginia. And, and you're probably thinking, why, why would you think that would be a good game to watch over the weekend? The reason I say that is it would be the first test for Oregon. Now, people were going crazy, especially and since they moved up in the ranking by one spot, because they beat Nicholas State. <laughs> I mean, that's Nicholas State, and, you know, they're going, oh, the offense is still there, this and that. Well, you played Nicholas State, so that's not much of a huge you know, who that you won. I mean, that was just a given. Uh, which I guess you can't really say that because of Kansas State losing and all this, but Oregon's much better. Anyways, them going to Virginia, which Virginia has a lot more to play for than Oregon does. You know, Virginia's going to want to get that upset and get that victory over Oregon and say Oregon's not what they used to be and how Oregon's going to go against a much better talented defense. Not saying Virginia's the great defense because they're not, but they're a whole lot better than Nicholas State. And having going from the West Coast to the East Coast in that time period, uh, how they'll be able to still run the offense. I'm still not sold on Oregon. 
that's the main reason I'm, tr I'm saying this, but, you know, this will be a first test. If they put over more than 50 points, uh, or more than 45 points, I'll, I'll say that. More than 45 points, then I, uh, their BCS, uh, BCS, you know, potential teams. If they barely get out by more than, if they win more uh, by 17 points, they're not a good team. They're not a good team. They're not going to be. They won't win against Stanford, barely beating Virginia, and that'll be the major game. But and my last game is number 15 Texas, which is overrated, against BYU. Now everybody that I've read from blogs and all this other sorts of stuff, they're saying that Texas, oh, they're so good. They got their went through the first test against New Mexico State. I saw that on ESPN, and I, I, I wanted to go off because New Mexico State, not a good team. And <laughs> it's just funny because when I read that saying that Texas went through their first test and beating New Mexico State, offense is great, you know, defense is back, and Texas is where they need to be. It's just like, why would you say that after they played a weak team? I mean, of course Texas was going to win that game and they were going to put up a lot of points against that. I mean, Texas State University, and a lot of my viewers are from Texas and, and San Marcos area. Texas State beat New Mexico State 66 to, like, 17. So if Texas State put up a whole lot of points against that team, obviously Texas was going to put a lot more. So don't don't get over happy with Texas being able putting up this many points and all their back. If Texas State did that, that shows New Mexico State's not the best. And I'm sorry for New Mexico State fans, but th I'm just trying to si trying to say where Texas is at. They're not a top 20 team. And now they got to go on the road to BYU, which BYU did lose to Virginia. Um, so it makes me question where they're really at. But the point is, being in a higher altitude, which could be the minor thing, but just something I should put out there. And BYU being a much stronger team than New Mexico State is. Texas going on the road over there. Now, they did play last year. I don't have the score. Uh, Texas did win. I, I think it was maybe about by 10 points or so. Uh, but this is going to be a different environment that Texas has been in uh, in a very, very long time. So how Texas will respond to that, I hope to see BYU win. Uh, I think they can win very, very easily. Uh I'm not saying BYU is a great team, but I just think they have more advantage over Texas, uh, have more of an advantage than Texas does. Uh, so I hope to see that, you know, see the scoreboard and it says BYU 27, Texas 21, final score. Uh, I, BYU can win, and I'm going I'm to bet against Texas in almost every game, but it's hard when they're playing, you know, three of their four non-conference games are like a New Mexico State. So we'll see how that goes. And basically that was it. You know, finally I got, I was able to have enough time to finish the show. Um, I know last week, we, you know, I talked about having, uh, going through all the NFL divisions, but I started too late with the, the radio thing, and that was my fault. I thought I was going to be able to get uh, to talk about every NFL division but got work going. That's why this show is pretty late. And I'm pretty out of breath right now. <laughs> uh, that's why I've been kind of like sounding a little bit different, going away from the mic. Um, but basically, keep hoping to keep the show Mondays and Fridays uh, every week so we can talk about recapping what happened during the, uh, the week. Jeez. Yeah, during the week. There we go. And uh, what to look for. Those are my games of what to look for why to look for them, and somewhat of my prediction. Uh, also, um, yeah, just keep it on Mondays and Fridays. That's what I'm trying to say. Mondays, Fridays, I'll be on here. Again, if you miss any episodes, go on YouTube. And even if you already heard the past episodes, just go on YouTube, type in the Short Sports Show. If you see me, click on the channel, give it a like, subscribe, so you can always, you know, if you ever do miss one if, at any time, you can go back and it'll be on there after the show, uh, about maybe 10 minutes after the show. The episode will be up now. Uh, but again, thank you guys for joining. Again, leave a like, follow me on Twitter, and uh, 
Come back next week on Monday. Thank you guys for watching.